The C4 Corvette is honestly one of the most underrated cars ever. Over here on Worthless Whips, we usually like to buy cheap cars, fix them up a little bit, do some road tests and all that, but we also like to sometimes talk about cars that have made a big influence on us. Our dream cars, for instance, cars we're busy working on as a project. But this time, I would like to talk to you about a car which probably has some of the most heavy sentimental value to me. The 1984 to 1996 C4 Corvette. Now this generation of Corvette doesn't see a lot of love. Most people think it's ugly and compared to all the other generations is the worst. But let's dial this back a bit. I mean, yes, I agree. There are better looking Corvettes than the C4. In fact, I recently restored from a completely seized up shell of a car a 1968 C3 Corvette and made it my daily driver. But I promise you that it is a far inferior, far worse car than the C4. I didn't ever think that I would make it to America, but a subscriber of mine in Arizona invited me to come and visit. And after a lot of hassle with visas and so on, I came to visit and I just loved it. It was incredible. We went on a small road trip and of course I got introduced to just the American way of life. And I knew that before I died, I wanted to do a coast to coast road trip through America. And of course it has to be in an American car. Now, I was living in China at the time and I didn't have a lot of money to spare. So I went online and I looked at all the kind of dream cars that I would love to drive from coast to coast. And of course, my sort of top ones being a 1970 Dodge Challenger or a 71 Cuda are just ridiculous. You have to pay over 100,000 US dollars to get one that's capable of doing a long road trip. And uh, if you get a cheap one, it's just going to be a piece of crap. And there are no cheap ones anyway. They start in a running condition at around 30, 40,000 US dollars, which is just ridiculous, especially for what you're getting. Uh, next up, of course, my second most prized, wanted, desired dream car is a 1978 Trans Am. But of course, if you want to get one that's in good enough condition to do a coast to coast trip, you're starting somewhere in the fifteen to $25,000 range, which of course, I didn't even have that much money to my name. What am I going to do, buy a car and go coast to coast on a, on a sort of a whim? Because, you know, at the time, I didn't think that I would ever end up in America. I thought that I would just do a single road trip and in the car and have to sell it afterwards or, or what have you. So I then looked at the third generation Trans Ams and Firebirds. And of course, this is another dream car of mine obviously because of Knight Rider and whatnot growing up. But these, unfortunately, are either in terrible condition or in very good condition and too expensive as well. But something that kept coming up in my searches were Corvettes. Now, we all know that if you buy a classic Corvette, so the, the, the second, the third generation ones, they're just far too expensive. If you get one that's in good condition, again, they're just the C2 Cor Corvettes are astronomically priced. The C3 Corvettes, you can get a reasonable one for around eight to 10,000 US dollars, but they are incredibly primitive cars and they are very, very harsh when it comes to driving. It's not something you want to take on a very long road trip. Not only that, they're terrible on gas mileage and they have absolutely no space to store anything inside. So yeah, the C3 is just not really an option. The C4s, however, kept cropping up and they looked really good. I mean, I've always liked the styling because growing up in the 80s, that whole aesthetic, the pop-up headlights, you know, the sort of wedge shape, I absolutely love it. And it is one of the best looking cars to me anyway. So I started looking into them a little more. And you know what? I started to really like what I saw. They're very sporty, the seats, the interior, the dashboard, especially the 80s one with uh, you know all the sort of multicolored digital dash and all that. Um, and just in general, I like the lines of the car and it looks like a fantastic car. And I couldn't believe how cheap they were in comparison to everything else I was looking at anyway. 
So I started looking and you could see you could buy a really clapped out one in a terrible condition for about 3000 US dollars. And then approaching 10,000, you could get one in great shape. So I kind of went middle of the road. Now, bear in mind that if you want a manual, which is what I really wanted, uh, you know, stick shift, as they say in America, it's far more expensive than getting an automatic one. And also the manual ones always seem to be in worse condition. It's probably the kind of person who wants to drive a manual is usually the kind of person who's going to be a bit harder on driving the car. Either way, with a lot of help from my friend Seamil, because we'd go through the classifieds on Craigslist and so on in Arizona, because, uh, you know, that's where my friend, uh, my, my friend and subscriber lives, because he was going to go help me buy the car. Uh, we found a couple of good ones in and around the five to seven thousand dollar range. But this particular one really caught my eye. It's mainly down to the color. It's an incredibly special color. It's called Black Rose. And it is probably my favorite color on a car. It looks to me just fantastic. It's a, it's a good mix of something special, something classy, something kind of mysterious. I don't know how to explain it, but I love the color and it goes with this car so well. In fact, there were only about 900 of them made uh, in this year anyway with a specific color. So it's very rare and the price was good too. Uh, the guy wanted seven and a half thousand uh, US dollars. We managed to negotiate, well, with my friend's help, we negotiated down to, I think it was 7,200. And I sent the money to my friend in America through a very complicated uh, Hong Kong bank transaction. And he bought the car on my behalf. And there it sat in his garage, waiting for me to finalize all my preparations for my long road trip. And this is where I can really sing the praises of this car. I, within about a month and a half, drove it more than 10,000 miles. I drove from Arizona to the West Coast, all the way up the West Coast, went inland over to Reno, down through Vegas, and then all the way through the country, ending up down in Maryland, and then going all the way up to New York, state to meet up with Seamilk and we had Christmas together and my wife flew in from China and everything and it was quite a fantastic time and of course after that I drove all the way back to the west coast with my wife in the car and all our luggage and then back to Arizona so it was a hell of a road trip and this thing did not skip a beat I drove through snowy mountains, which is quite ridiculous. In fact, I had a big scare in Utah because I went up a mountain and bear in mind, I've never driven in snow before. I mean, in Africa, I've driven in soft sand, so I kind of know the dynamic, but I had never driven in snow. And this is a rear wheel drive, powerful rear wheel drive car. And I got stuck up on a mountain at a very high elevation where the signs were all saying like, you need snow chains and all that, but I had no choice. I couldn't turn back. I had to soldier on and I made it through. The traction control actually works in this car. I had to go very slowly, driving at about 30 miles an hour the whole time, but I made it through. So I went through snow, I went through deserts, the heat of the deserts. I went through high elevation, low elevation, every kind of situation, torrential downpours down near um, Alabama, etc. And I tell you what, this car just kept on going. Sure, I had a couple of electrical niggles with the um, door ajar switch which was really frustrating so driving at night it would just kind of flicker on and off the lights inside which was very distracting but i took care of that on the side of the road by disconnecting the little uh, switches so you know the typical quality control problems with an american car you know cheap electrical switches and stuff were an issue but other than that mechanically it was perfect and even better i was averaging around 27 miles a gallon which is just incredible for a car with a big V8 in it like this one. So not only did it see me through the journey, but it was actually incredibly comfortable to drive. This car is fantastic on the big open interstates. You're cruising at about 70 to 80 miles an hour at about 2000 RPMs. It's perfect. It's got cruise control. You can just chill out, relax and enjoy the journey. I loved that trip and I have so many fond memories and just being able to pull off on the side of the road in these beautiful areas and take photos of the car uh, I got approached multiple times by people you know complimenting me on the color of the car specifically 
I remember I had uh, more than once little kids come up and ask if they could take a photo of the car, you know, that kind of thing. It was, it was great. It made me feel special. And it was just such a pleasant journey. The air conditioning is stellar in this car. And the fact that you can pop the top off, you know, the Targo off, and then pretty much have a convertible gives you that added little bit of uh, fun. So, for instance, when I made it to the West Coast, I took the roof off and I could drive around under the palm trees and feel special and, you know, it's like driving an exotic car. I, I just have to say that this car was fantastic. And not only do you have the reliability and the good gas mileage, but the handling is incredible. I took it up in some of the mountains where I got to really get a feel for the thing and it corners like nothing else that I'd ever owned before. It's planted to the road. It's got a fantastic suspension system. And yeah, I mean, I've got nothing but good things to say about the car. So I would like you to consider next time you're out there, if you don't have a big budget, but you want a lot of car for your money, why not take a look at a C4 Corvette? But I must caution you to get one that's in good condition because spare parts for this car are not cheap. Anyway, that's it. Uh, honestly, when it comes to the drawbacks of this car, if I have to be completely honest with you, I'd say the only real drawback to this car is storage. So, you know, you can't, well, you, first of all, you can only have two people in the car. But yeah, I mean, you don't have that much space to store things. That being said, though, I still managed to play a very good game of Tetris and get a hell of a lot of things in the back. In fact, here's a picture of me and my wife traveling across uh, the US in the thing. Um, I love the car and sadly, I'm going to have to let it go because I no longer have the space to keep it and I hate to see it deteriorate. So I really have someone who's agreed to buy it and uh, I'm going to be saying goodbye soon. But to any of you out there who are looking for a second car or perhaps your first car, something that's fun and exciting to drive, something that's practical, economical, and above all else, really cool. I can do nothing but suggest the C4 Corvette. I really hope you guys enjoyed this rather in-depth look at the fourth generation Chevrolet Corvette. And of course, we will be doing many more cars here on Worthless Whips. Thank you for watching and see you next time.